Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of American Rambler. I'm your host, Colin Woodward. Thank you for listening to the podcast. On today's show, I have author Ben Beard. He has written a book recently on movies. It is called The South Never Plays Itself, A Film Buff's Journey Through the South on Screen. It is available through New South Books. There are a lot of movies discussed in this book. Sometimes he will go geographically talking about movies in Texas or movies in Florida. Not a lot of movies set in certain parts of the South, such as Virginia. We talk about that a little bit. I'm not sure why, but certainly there are a lot of movies set in Texas. Everything from Texas Chainsaw Massacre to Dazed and Confused and No Country for Old Men and also a lot of movies set in Florida. Uh, you will see other movies set in places like Mississippi or, or Tennessee. Sling Blade was set in Arkansas, but uh, certainly Texas and Florida take up a lot of discussion about movies and you can write a book just about Texas or Florida and maybe Ben will do that further down the road but he has written this book which is a very entertaining kind of personal essay at times about his experiences growing up watching movies and his background and just kind of how he feels about things generally right now. A lot of people not feeling great about the state of the country given COVID and fascism and white supremacy and all that good stuff. But Ben lives in Chicago now, which he likes quite a bit. He grew up in the Deep South, but has been in Chicago for quite a while. Has a full-time job, so he tries to do his writing on his breaks and in the morning and whenever he gets time. So uh, he's been very productive in the last year and throughout his career. He has other books, one about the Civil Rights Movement, one about Muhammad Ali. So he keeps very busy. I enjoyed reading this. It was a quick read at a time of year where, you know, I, I want something that's that's entertaining around the holidays. So I was reading this in, in around Thanksgiving and, and December before I talked to him. So I would certainly recommend this book and had fun talking with him about movies, which I don't get to do a whole lot on this podcast. What else has been going on? Well, we got some snow today. It's still coming down here in Richmond, kind of a weird night. It started in the 60s last night. It was quite warm, but very overcast, and you could, you could tell the rain was coming, but it uh, didn't cool down until this morning. The snow just kept coming for hours, so the kids got out of school. They called it last night, as they do in Virginia. They don't mess around, so even before we got any snow, they had canceled school and probably will not have school tomorrow either as it's going to continue cold and going to be very chilly tonight. So things are going to freeze up tomorrow. I'm guessing that I haven't, I haven't checked, so I don't know if they've canceled school yet, but I think that's going to happen. I'm recording this on the 3rd of January. New Year has come and gone. I think the less said about 2021, the better. I survived it. You survived it. Uh, maybe not with your sanity entirely intact and constant worries about getting sick and other things going on. Uh, the Omicron numbers are off the charts, half a million people a day. So COVID is, is raging right now, and just don't really feel like it's ever going to go away. And I don't know how great the response has been lately. It's tough getting tests. A lot of people are getting sick. I know people... Thankfully, no one in our household has gotten it yet, but uh, relatives and in-laws and people are getting it and uh, just really don't want to leave the house right now, honestly. So I have, I've been staying home, but the kids are going back to school this week and I got to go back to work. So I uh, don't know uh, how long we can avoid it, but we're all vaxxed and boosted. So if we do get it, hopefully it will be a quote unquote mild case. Still not 100% over this cold I got a few weeks ago before to, before Christmas, which was a rough one. And my wife is still kind of sick. She had bronchitis. So entering 2022 a bit beat up, just as we entered 2021 beat up. And uh, I, don't, I don't think this is going to be another easy one, but uh, we can hope for the best. All right. Well, hope you had a, a decent holiday. 
and uh, didn't do something stupid and, and get COVID. But uh, a lot of people were going to parties and stuff, and lo and behold, someone testing positive not long after. So it's it's ugly out there, but it is nice to get a snowfall here. This is probably the biggest one we've had in a couple of years. We didn't get much last year, so a very decent snowfall for Richmond, and the kids are enjoying it. And I was out there too, so it's been kind of a fun day, but uh, did have to record this intro. All right, well, that's enough out of me. Let's have a talk about movies in the South with Ben Beard. Thanks for talking with me today. I'm glad we could do this. I definitely want to talk about the book, but uh, talk a little bit about your experiences in the South because we're sort of the same but different in the sense we've both spent a lot of time in the North and in the South. And you've gone the opposite direction of me. I started in the North and went down South, but you, you were born in the South. Where, where, where were you born again? Was it Georgia? Yeah, I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and I moved to Pensacola, Florida when I was like six and a half, seven. And then I lived there till I was 18. And then I went to college in Montgomery, Alabama. And I didn't, I moved back to Atlanta as an adult. And then I moved away when I was 26. And I've, I've lived outside ever since. And how long have you been in Chicago? Oh, God, a long time. Maybe, uh, let's see, 14 years, maybe. Okay. And I was in Iowa City for two years before that. Okay. Are you in the city proper or are you in the suburbs? I'm in the city and I love it. Okay. I love it. It's like, I love it. I, I love that you got to pay attention when you're doing anything and there's always <laughs> stuff going on. I'm serious. I love it. I love that you got to like, <laughs> you know, that there's yeah. always uh, people around and you got to, you got to keep your eyes open and uh, what, what part are you in? I'm in, uh, it's like right on the edge of Albany park, which is uh, a North side neighborhood. Okay. Uh, Latino, most of the Latino neighborhood. And I'm sort of on a little sliver of Ravenswood manor, which is a, a little wealthy area. I mean, we're the sort of the poorest people on the block here, but, and then, uh, uh, you know, a little, East of us is Lincoln Square, which is an old German neighborhood. Okay. Named after Abraham Lincoln, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. There's a statue of him by our Walgreens. Okay. So, um, yeah, like, is there a landmark near you? There's a bunch of parks. There's a giant library, the, the regional library, the Solzer Regional. Oh, uh, you know, we're, we're probably three miles from Wrigley Field. Okay. Uh, okay. And that's, you know, kind of, I mean, it's not my favorite area but it's a, a lot of bars and yeah uh, sort of people acting dumb and you know baseball <laughs> <laughs> what is the neighborhood that wrigley is in what do they call that uh wrigleyville wrigleyville okay um i was thinking there's some other name for it but uh i i've spent a little bit of time in chicago but it's mostly south side yeah i think i went to wrigley once but i was more in the uh, university of chicago area which I liked a lot. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I loved it. Um, but obviously, it's a big city and there's a, a lot of different neighborhoods that I didn't I didn't get to see very much. But spent a lot of time downtown. Downtown is great. Michigan yeah. Ave is terrific. I'm sure this time of year, Michigan Ave is great, right? It is. It's str- where the city's really struggling right now. There's a there's a spike in crime. And oh, uh, yeah, it's um, it's not good. And no one really knows what to do about it. And uh, progressive and left-wing people like me, it puts us in a really tough spot because our um, solutions tend to be long-term and, and sort of feel goody. But they don't mean much, you know, when when we're in the grips of it. So I, I don't know. It is stunningly beautiful uh, at this time of year. We always go down to the Art Institute and go ice skating in Maggie Daly Park with my children. Oh, but, nice. Uh, it's just tough. Uh, it's a tough time for the city right now. I've heard stories about the crime the last couple of years and a lot of, I, I think pretty much every city is going through that now. It's just a matter yeah. of degree. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we here in Richmond, it's, it's nothing like the really rough times in the nineties, but it, it certainly, the crime has gotten a lot worse and it's historically, it's a, it's a crime-ridden city. I yeah, mean, I tell people all the time. I'll say, "Do you know what the murder capital of the world is?" Off and on, you know, every right. And I, I will say Richmond, like per capita. I'd be like, "What? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about?" I'm like, "I'm <laughs> telling you, 
Oops, Yay, yeah. Richmond! Yeah, oh, <laughs> it, it, it's it's a it, it was kind of like um, Little Rock, maybe not to the degree although Little Rock's had its its uh, times too, where it was really bad. But it's like it has all the problems of the big city, but not necessarily the the services and conveniences of a of a big city. I mean, yeah, sure. There's a lot to do, but it's not like Chicago. I mean, there's no train you can take down, you know, downtown or, you know, it just doesn't have that kind of grandeur. But uh, I don't know. I mean, I was reading your book and I, I, I really liked the book. I liked that it was written by a person <laughs> yeah. who I could sort of sense what he was like. I like, kind of knew him. Uh, wasn't just like a lot of books, you know, you're like, who the hell wrote this? Um, right. but I kind of feel like we're sort of on the same wavelength in terms of, you know, what's going on these days. And, uh, obviously you, you're raising kids, I'm raising kids and, you know, to see like, yeah, you know, the city problems that have, that have come back, um, and just all these other systematic problems that we have now, it's, it, it can just be a, a little overwhelming. So there's sort of a, a weariness and and parts of the book where I was just like, I totally understand this man. <laughs> well, it's funny. <laughs> totally yeah, get it. I finished it. I worked on it for years, off yeah. I mean, seven years or eight years or something. And the first draft was maybe six hundred and fifty pages. And I um, we started the rewriting and editing phase right when I, I turned it in before Trump was elected. And then okay, COVID hit. And I started rewriting and editing and the editor was, did a great job, but, um, you know, it was painful because they cut a bunch of stuff out. And, um, but, yeah. um, so I did some of that snuck in at the rewriting phase and I wrote the ending at the end. Um, but like I was, we're, you know, we're living in heartbreaking times and to ignore, to, to ignore that is to not be living in the world, you know? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of, what we're going through now can certainly inform you looking back at certain movies and writing about them. I mean, and as rough as it is personally to kind of be living in this time, like you watch these movies and you're like, Oh, this is re- This is relevant to what's yeah. going on. You know, a movie yeah. about the clan or whatever. Um, Cause you, you cover a lot of ground here. I mean, you, I, I don't know how many mo- do you, you know how many movies you actually talk about in this book? I don't. But so to to I about a hundred or two hundred films got cut. Um, okay, which is hilarious to me. But um, it's you know there's a lot, right? Well, it, it's a classic thing, right? I mean, you, no matter how many you write about, there's somebody who's going to be like, uh, why didn't you talk about an uh, interview with a vampire or? Uh, <laughs> Right. Sound or, you know, something like that's a Southern movie, but it's like, you just can't, you can't get to everything, but yeah, um, you get into a good amount of detail with, with a lot of these, these, you said it's, it's taken you a long time to write it, but um, why exactly did you want to write this book? Uh, I wrote, I was writing novels uh, for a long time and I got started in, I went into a job at book publishing in Montgomery, Alabama after I graduated college. My goal was to publish my first novel by the time I was 25. Um, That didn't happen. I published a a fair number of stuff and I had a column in a a local newspaper and then I was reviewing films in Atlanta magazine and I was working on uh, um, my own work and I was interviewing directors and stars and stuff. And I was like, man, I'm on my way. I'm going to make it. (laughs) And then (laughs) I kind of fell through. I, I... I don't know if it was self-sabotage or um, America, you know, or my own mediocrity, but I failed and failed and failed and like fell into like a twilight America. And uh, I didn't have a job. I couldn't find a job that would sustain my life. And I was hustling for freelance work and I was still trying to write these novel manuscripts. Anyway, I, you know, I got a master's degree. I started working in public education. I had children, but I was still writing at night and at lunch and stuff. But the fiction just wasn't, the fiction train wasn't working for me. And I wasn't even submitting places or anything. I, I don't know what I thought was going to happen. That yeah. Like a, a genie was going to appear. Uh, <laughs> but so <laughs> I had written a book with Randall Williams on the civil rights movement. And he was my first boss and we're friends. And he's sort of a mentor to me. And I said, hey, let's do, he loves movies too. I was like, let's do a movie, a book, a book on Southern movies. 
And he liked the idea. And I said, I'll do the movie part and you can do the history part. And it'll be like, we'll do like the first and, you know, best book on the subject. So I did a sample chapter and then he said, you know what, you should just do it on your own. And so then uh, that's, so I saw it, I kind of, you know, started that way. And my wife had said, she had suggested to me, you know, before I pitched this to Randall, like, Hey, have you thought about doing like a movie thing about the South? So, um, yeah, that's like the genesis of it, but it was a, it was a big apple. I mean, I didn't realize when I set out, I didn't realize how vast the topic was going to be. And so, um, I ended up with the kind of alternative history of the movies almost, you know, uh, in, in the first draft, because it was, it was just a hundred plus years of, of filmmaking, you know, and culture and, and, and terrible behavior in the South and so on. And so, yeah, I, I didn't have like a grand vision in mind. Uh, I love films. I'm obsessive about them. And, and, you know, I had written about them before. And so I was like, well, I'll try to do like a personal um, thing about how movies impact real our world, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it's funny what you were just saying about being an aspiring novelist because that's that's what I wanted to do too, <laughs> and I probably had the same aspiration. It was like, yeah, by twenty five, I could probably have a novel published because I mean, I've read my whole life and I've read a ton of stuff, and you you sort of you, you read certain guys and you just kind of like think that that world still exists that these guys were talking about in like the thirties and forties, like yeah you write a short story and Harper's will publish it and pay you like a thousand dollars or something yeah, like, yeah, right. Yeah. You know, well, Henry Miller did it, you know, it's like, or whoever, I mean, yeah. you know, it's like you're reading the biggest guys and as tough as it was for them, like it still somehow seemed easy, but yeah, I, I wrote a lot of fiction and I, I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I didn't know where to start and I still wouldn't know where to start if I had to do it now. Um, Cause it just seems like the fiction market, has completely bottomed out except for like the 1% of authors who can actually make money doing it. Um, but you kind of have to start somewhere. So it sounds like, yeah, you were doing freelance and then you decided to write a book. And in reading the book, it sounds like you, you were sort of a, you had kind of a late start in terms of watching movies. Is that accurate to say, or at least like, yeah, well, gritty I movies. Yes. So yeah. I watched movies my whole life with my dad and my older sister. And then, uh, and, but it was, there was no, um, my dad had pretty good taste actually, but it was like Westerns and war movies and stuff. Okay. But I had no sense. I, I was not, um, I didn't have a sense for movies, right. Beyond like what I liked until I was maybe 19. And then, um, I started watching Ingmar Bergman. Oh, I started watching gangster films with a neighbor. But seriously, right? Like one after another. And then I was like, oh my God, this is, you know, and it was all good stuff. It's Godfather 1 and 2 and Scarface and, you know, Carlito's Way and yeah. Goodfellas and stuff. Some of I've seen before, but not in the like, now I'm watching this because it's a gangster film, right? And then um, I started watching Ingmar Bergman and it was a fluke, really. Uh, it was a fluke. I don't even remember. I don't remember how it started. So I started watching Ingmar Bergman, but it was like blinders falling off my eyes. And very quickly, I had an appetite for um, French cinema and, you know, uh, J Japanese cinema. And and I had always loved old movies. Uh, I always said I loved old movies, but then I really started to, I, I have just an inexhaustible appetite uh, for for everything for all of it, you know, uh, good, bad, high, low, uh, uh, foreign, you know, big Hollywood blockbusters. I mean, I like them all. Even when I hate it, I kind of like it. Yeah. I, I was going back through your book today and you said something like that, like just pretty much you like everything at some level. Yeah. Yeah. And... Because, you know, a, they're so complex, right. And like, there's so many things that can go wrong on a movie, like one actor, can like, like the director having a breakdown, one actor can screw up a film, uh, the money can run out. So they have to like rush, rush it. Right. Uh, um, the, there can be natural disasters and stuff. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong. And yet, you know, especially in, in America, most of the films that are actually quite, the quality is quite high. Um, 
and they always tell us something, right? Like a popular movie tells us something about us, um, even if I think it's dumb. <laughs> I, mean, I, I enjoy like like dumb action movies that everyone likes, right? Like they tell us a lot about our values and uh, you know who lives and who dies, and, and the, even the one liners and stuff. Like why is it funny that someone's getting killed, right? Like who's getting killed and why is it funny? I mean, that's just, that kind of stuff's interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I'm guessing, I mean, you probably, when you were growing up, this was the video cassette. Yes. The video cassette video store period. Sure. Um, where, you know, I was born in 75. So it was like, you went to the movies until the mid eighties and then you started renting stuff. Yeah. Um, so do you have a lot of memories of like, going to actual movies or was it more about watching stuff at home you think but uh, i went to the theater with my dad we went almost every weekend he's an enormous okay. movie fan okay uh, I mean, to be clear he's a huge fan and he yeah. also has a basically an inexhaustible appetite i mean he would take me to like garbage that i wanted to see when i was like eight he would like take me and he liked it you know he so the theater is weirdly sacred to me i mean i would go to church every sunday but then either sunday afternoon or saturday when i didn't have a soccer game I would go to a movie. Okay. So like it was very in, in my life. And then in our teen, I lived in Pensacola, Florida, right? So in teenage years, we went to the movies all the time and we just saw the like mainstream stuff. And my favorite movies when I was a kid was like RoboCop, uh, Time Machine, the Rod Taylor one, uh, Lethal Weapon, which is like, I mean, it's kind of ridiculously terrible i rewatched it the other day but i loved it as a kid and i thought it was serious it like told me something about being a man uh, <laughs> but yeah and and i liked uh, fantasy and science fiction and, and you know uh, lots of action i i don't know i i yeah i so yeah i went to the video store a lot too usually when i was like 14 15 but we were always hunting for uh like the trashiest horror movies we could find yeah. Yeah. I think that a lot of high school was kids talking about horror movies. Yeah. And yeah. they also played a ton of movies on TV back yes. then. So yes. I could see a lot on TV that um, was pretty much virtually some of them. Sometimes they weren't even edited. I mean, it was just the straight up Halloween two. our version was on a local station. So it was great. Um, that's an early horror movie for me and it scared the shit out of me when I was like in like seventh grade or something yeah, I saw it on TV yeah. and it was scary uh, and yeah like I have a theory that people our age we're about the same age yeah, um, were influenced by TBS because TBS had like would show like ch like cl you know clusters of films uh, for like two years and then they just wouldn't show them anymore and I saw like uh, Chuck Norris movies and Conan the Barbarian, uh, like like a hundred times, you know, just all the time <laughs> it was on. And I liked movies as a kid. I mean, I I don't I did like movies more than TV shows and stuff, but I just didn't have any sense of like good movies or bad movies, you know. Yeah, well, it sounds similar. Like my dad was into westerns, action movies, so we would go to him he he took us to the movies more but whatever we were watching yeah he's usually you know clint eastwood charles bronson the yeah. queen like those kind of guys my mom was a little more highbrow uh so you know she would watch like david lean movies and things like that so <laughs> it was kind of great i mean yeah, yeah you had great. like two parents that had different tastes but you're getting uh a good education but um when you're sitting down to write this book, like how did you sort of approach it? I mean, you'd obviously had seen a lot of movies. You probably could say like, well, I can come up with a hundred movies off the top of my head or whatever that I maybe want to talk about. But going forward from that, do you just like, I'm just going to try to watch as much as I can. Sort of. I mean, I, first off, I believe books should unfold for the reader. So, I mean, I like believe that that there should yeah. be pleasure in a book, even if it's challenging or whatever, it should, it should unfold. Right. And so I was, that was in my mind when I was writing this and I was, I started out chronologically. Okay. So each chapter was going to have an illuminating film, one film that all the other movies bounced off of, right. That like shown, shown a light in all the other films. The problem with that approach, 
And that's what I was doing with Nashville. I wrote the chapter on Nashville first, the music. Okay. The problem with that is that there's all these outliers and then there's these certain personalities that are really important that have to, they need to be, uh, when it comes to the Southern representation and, you know, they have to be addressed separate from like one movie. And then there's sort of genres that uh, I think are, get a peculiar color and cast when they're set in the South. And so I kind of had to throw that out. And so I started then, I was like, I'll do, uh, each chapter will be like a decade in a different person or genre. But I had to kind of throw that out too. Uh, but then I came back to it at the end. So it starts with Birth of a Nation. I was going to write Birth of a Nation to Birth of a Nation. I thought it was very clever. You know, the uh, Trey yeah. Parker film about, uh, I was going to do that. And I was like, uh, I'm. this is going to be, smart and, and funny and, and it's going to also be interesting because it's the same title but like a totally different movie but movies kept coming out and the book was delayed and the world was changing and so i had to like i want i i had to like i was like digesting that as i was writing the stuff trump's ascendancy the charlottesville thing i had a whole thing about like confederate memorials and stuff uh, I got cut out, but anyway, I don't, I had an outline, but I kept throwing the outline out. And then because I'm an idiot, I wrote the whole, all the pieces like simultaneously. So I would like write a paragraph on uh, little foxes. And then I would like write a couple pages on uh, uh, Texas movies. And then I, you know, and, and so the manuscript was a mess. I mean, it was a mess. Yeah. But in the mess, there was like a lot, a lot of good stuff got cut, I think. And what I tried to do, because I love it, is like I tried to situate each movie inside the director's canon, you know, canon and uh, work, body of work. But a lot of that got cut out because the book's too long. So yeah. it was, I would say it was more move, insider movie-ish in its first incarnation. And now it's more kind of like pop culture history kind of stuff. But I just sat down, I, I would write at lunchtime. Uh, often while watching uh, movies at, at work, I had 20 minutes at lunch and then I would write at night and I got up at five in the morning and I would watch, I would try to watch an hour of something. Then I work in a school. So, you know, and then in the summer I would, I try to make my way through a bunch of stuff. And I, I mean, I did a ton of research. Yeah, no, for sure. But I think as you just said, you're with your schedule, you know, things can get kind of fragmented with the writing if you don't have like huge chunks of time to do it. Um, oh, yeah. And also since you're watching a movie, then I don't know, like, would you watch it and then sort of write down your initial impressions or something? Or would yeah, you maybe, so, yeah. Yeah. I had a, I have a note, I had a notebook and then I would sometimes like some of the movies I watched on YouTube because they weren't in the library and I couldn't yeah. rent them or buy them anywhere. And I would like have a do word doc open and like type as the movie was going on. Uh, that's not really a good way to watch a movie, but <laughs> <laughs> I would rewatch them too. I mean, a lot of these I saw more than once. And then um, I was trying to be thorough. I mean, people have already taken me to task about like, why isn't the color purple in there? Why isn't Sounder in there? Uh, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Sounder I had seen, but hadn't rewatched. And I just there were like a lot of movies like that I already talked about and the color purple is a whole, I mean, I just, I, I, I have movies about black citizens in the United States, in the South. Right. I have movies about women, like a chapters on those things, but I just didn't, I don't know. I mean, I just screwed it up, I guess, but <laughs> like, well, I, you know, yeah, I mean, you can only, you can't talk about everything. And I mean, there are, there are definitely some more obscure movies that, you do talk about that I think would be more helpful to someone reading this because, you know, I like to get movie recommendations. I mean, I wouldn't assume everyone's seen the color purple, but you know, I have, and yeah. a lot of people have seen that, but I, I think for some people, you know, they'd rather hear about something a little bit more obscure or right. something that maybe has a little bit more significance historically. I mean, color purple is a great movie, but it's not birth of a nation in terms of its impact. And, sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, you 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 have to make those choices, and yeah, some stuff just gets cut out. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff got cut out. I mean, yeah, I had um, a lot of sort of thrillers, uh, 
a lot of them were in Flo set in Florida. And there was already so many movies in Florida, like they got like whittled out. I'll say that one of the movies that blew me away in this was God's Little Acre, which is an Anthony Mann uh, directed film with a great cast. And it was, it, what I loved about it, it was filmed in the 50s. What I loved about it, it's like kind of a noir film. It's kind of a drama. It's kind of a, a horror movie. It's very sexy. It's titillating. And it's, uh, it's a little bit of everything. And it, they pull it off, you know. That was a real gem for me. And I, I know it's not like some super obscure movie, but it's really non-movie fans are never going to watch God, God's Little Acre, right? Unless like someone recommends it to them. That was a really, uh, that was a good discovery for me. Yeah, um, I, I think, no, I mean, it's safe to say a lot of these movies, people just aren't watching anymore unless, like you, they're, they're a real movie buff or maybe they have to watch it for a class or something like that. And I think us being in our 40s now, like stuff that we assume people have seen, people have not seen. Like yeah. stuff we saw in the eighties or even the nineties, people are like, what, you know? Um, so there's like a real generational amnesia or whatever you want to call it with a lot of movies. And well, yeah, so there's so many films though, right? Like in yeah. one year, it's, it, it's, it hasn't changed really, but with streaming, there might be, you know, 200 something plus American films released. And it's, it's impossible to keep up just like, just like popular, just like music. It, you, you have to work to keep up with music. And inevitably, unless you're a critic, you eventually go, you know what, I've got, I like, what I've got enough music here, you know? Yeah. But with, with films, I mean, it's a shame because, you know, they, I heard uh, some critics say like the extended uh, highbrow streaming television shows have replaced the novel, right? To meet people's narrative needs. Like people are reading fewer novels because there's Mad Men and Breaking Bad and so on. I don't know if that's true, but I heard this, right? And you hear the same thing about films, right? I'll tell you, I watch all the shows with my wife and stuff. I've seen them all, okay? And I can't think of a show that wouldn't have been better if they hadn't truncated it and cut out some of the fat and made it into a film or two films, right? Like the show Girls would be the greatest movie about New York if they had like sliced it down to an hour and 40 minutes and, and picked the best stuff out of it, I think. Yeah. Uh, and I did just about all of the shows. That's true. Uh, to me, that's, I can't think of one and I've seen them all, almost all. I think most, most shows that's, that that's certainly true. I, I think there are some that do kind of earn, you know, five, seven seasons or whatever. But I think with like Netflix now, since they're producing so much, yeah. I think there definitely are a lot of shows where like this might have been an interesting movie, but instead they stretched it out for, you know, a whole season or, or whatever. I, mean, I get resentful, you know, yeah. uh, honestly. And even even, you know, let's say uh, let's say Breaking Bad, which was great and, and epic, you know, and, and I enjoyed it while I was watching it. But once it was over, I was like, why was that 50 hours of my life or 45 hours of my life? That's just <laughs> fucking crazy. You know what I mean? That's fucking crazy. Well, that when I think I, I'm at least grateful that, you know, see, yeah, like stuff like that. It's at least very high quality. Yeah, very, that's true. No, that's you, true. You know. great. I mean, I was watching Gilligan's Island and Brady Bunch when I was a kid. So like, yeah, me too. I, how many hours did I waste with that? Um, but yes. maybe, I, well, let me ask you, like, I, what do you kind of think of the future of movies? Like, do you think w there's two things to talk about there? You can talk about the form of the movie, which can be on any medium, can be on Netflix or can be in a theater or whatever. And then the actual experience of going to a movie, which is a different thing. Like, what do you kind of see the future of that? As, I mean, as an movie, going to the movies is going to be less and less important. I mean, it's going to be a less and less thing that people do in our yeah. culture. And that, that's an easy one to answer, right? Like HBO max has Dune and matrix, like, like big marquee hundred million plus film. They're just putting on their streaming platform for free. If you're a member, if you're so like, that's tells me a lot right there. And I know it was controversial and I, I love the movie theater. I adore the movie theater and I would pay more money than I own to be able to go, but my life doesn't really allow me to do it because the movie theater is not open at five in the morning when I'm getting up to watch stuff. So like, I don't, 
that one's easy. It's sad, but they're not going to disappear, right? Drive-ins are still around. Like they, they're not going to, movie yeah. aren't going to disappear. However, the form is an interesting one, right? Because as more and more directors realize that their stuff is going to be seen on TV, that will influence the visual style that they pick. Uh, Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick knew that the bulk of the people who were going to watch it were going to watch it on TV. I saw it in the theater when it came out. I liked it. No one else did. And then I saw it on TV. <laughs> it's true. I, I liked I it. Liked. I actually liked it too. Yeah, but I was in Montgomery, Alabama. Everyone was like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? So that was going to be a porno. And then I watched it on TV a couple years later. Like, and I was like, oh man, this movie is gorgeous. Yeah. And it's, he like, so I think that that's going to be more and more the norm. Right. And I think the form, it's like the plots have already caught up, right? Because a smartphone ruins every plot, the plot of like 90% of old movies. So they have to like, I love it when they, they have to somehow uh, neutralize the phone, right? It's like a plot thing that they have to deal with in a lot of movies. Right. Right. Um, but I mean, I feel good about like the quality. I, my theory is that this, this, this kind of a fixed rate of great films that come out every year, some years better than others, but like, it's really the middle film is the one that I worry about the, the, the B plus with like a, you know, a pretty good budget, a good director. Who's not like a, maybe a risk taker, like a Ron Howard or something. I worry about those kind of films like parenthood, which is a movie I really like. Yeah. I worry about that kind of movie. I don't see a future for it because we're too, it's like genre movies, right? Uh, grindhouse uh, uh, movies, issue films that people watch as like homework. Like, look at me, I'm progressive. I watched whatever. And then uh, I, but, but there's still great films. Like I watched power of the dog the other day on Netflix and I thought it was great. It was interesting. Yeah. Not for I, everybody. I mean, I, yeah. I acknowledge not for everybody, but it worked for me. I was like, this is an A list. The, the directing is on point. The performances are great. Uh, you know, my cousin hated it. Well, he didn't like it. So <laughs> I mean, well, that was another one of those movies where I was like, I, I would not have seen that in the theater and might have lost track of it if it had been a while before it came out on DVD, like in the old days, but it was right there on Netflix. I was like, oh, all right, I'll totally watch this, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I'm glad I did. Yeah. I mean, it was an interesting film. It was, uh, I, I don't know what you call it. It was almost like a Western horror movie, but not in sure. a slasher but sense. But that's Jane Campion, yeah. Campion, right? Like her movies are slow and unsettling. Uh, and they're like almost horror films. What I liked about it was I realized like, oh, the danger, you don't, the characters who seem dangerous are not that dangerous. Right. Yeah. But the characters that are traditionally um, on the edge of a movie is, in fact, not only the most interesting character, by far the most threatening or menacing. And I loved that. Um, I loved that. I don't want to, yeah. you know, if anyone listens to it, they haven't seen it. I mean, I don't want to ruin it, but I really like that a lot. Yeah. There was a twist at the end. And yeah, I wouldn't give it away. But um, no, I. I yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about. Like, maybe it is that, like you're saying, it's the middle ground that's going to get kind of lost because they're going to make the movies, the Marvel movies that'll make a billion dollars internationally. They're going to keep making those. And then sure. the artistic people will make their movie somehow or other where they get the yeah. financing through a studio or not. They'll, yeah, the Jane Campions will still be working. But yeah, maybe it'll be that middle, that middle brow swath that is not going to you know see production and that's what's going to be hurting the movie theaters because there just aren't going to be as many movies being made um and i just it's like uh i those middle brow films that we mock when they come out but then you revisit them and you're like oh this movie has great performances in it or this movie you know the movies that aren't like a big deal when they come out but then when you go back you look at the crowd scenes you look at the technique, right? And, and you see that there aren't like shortcuts. This is what I like, like about classic Hollywood is that they often, because everyone was the top person, right? Like it, everyone was like, like the production design was amazing. The costumers were great. The writers were top shelf. Even if some of the jokes don't age well, um, and the, maybe we have different types of acting now. I just, that middle brow film, I just think, they they did it so much better back then 
Well, and, and maybe at the sake of being nostalgic, I mean, there was something great about the 80s is that it seemed like there was more of that middle ground because there were some great sort of artsy movies, um, but then there's just a lot of just kind of crazy, stupid movies like Gremlins or... I mean, yeah. Back to the Future. I mean, it was... That's a it, great film. I, know, it, I love that movie. It's become I a think, classic now, but at the time, you're just like, well, this is just another fun yeah, movie. It's another fun movie, but it's so cleverly constructed. Uh, you, I'm sure you... Did you see Glow, that TV show? There was... Yeah. A, and Mark Maron's like writing a movie about a guy who wants to sleep with his mother, and so he builds a time machine so he can like hurt his father and sleep with his mother. <laughs> and But when he does it, it like messes up a lot. And then the other guy's turning and goes... Dude, you're just describing Back to the Future. He's like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I don't. I, you know, there were just tons of great comedies in the '80s. I know it's it's not considered like the '70s because the '70s is more serious and darker. But there were good comedies. There yeah. were good comedies in the '80s. Oh, I mean, absolutely. Like I, the '70s. The the thing about the '70s, I think, is that per the like hit to movie ratio like the hit to regular movie ratio is just off the charts once you start really thinking about all the movies that came out right and uh that's like like dog day afternoon came out in the 70s and i don't know if anyone would have that in their like top 20 70s movies but it's amazing uh, and i think that's the the key they they really i mean i could watch 70s movies all, all day but there's a certain kind of gritty oh god and, yeah. and they're they're kind of downers until oh yeah no, spielberg and lucas come along and it's like oh you can have a fun <laughs> 70s yeah. movie um but no i mean i, I just saw scarecrow a couple of weeks i've ago. seen that yeah it's a good film but it's a uh, talk about a downer heavy yeah it's it's heavy um it was, uh, i think it's david thompson who said that uh al pacino and dustin hoffman could have switched careers and no one would have noticed up to a point <laughs> and scarecrow is a good example because they look like each other at that time yeah and it feels like a dustin hoffman performance and movie yeah um, yeah I'm not, i wasn't sure about pacino in that in that role actually i mean i love gene hackman and he was gene hackman but i don't i was kind of just mentally i was playing around with that well if it wasn't pacino who might have been yeah dustin hoffman might have been interesting or was thinking Maybe like Dennis Hopper might have been kind of interesting. In he that. would have added yeah. a perverse weirdness to it, probably. <laughs> a, a, more of a druggy, you know, karate thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, let me get back to the book for a second. Yeah. I, just take something very basic. The, the title of the book, The South Never Plays Itself. Uh, what do you, why is it called that? What do you mean? What are you trying to get at there? Okay. Well, I saw this great documentary, Los Angeles Plays Itself, about Los Angeles being the most film city in the history of humankind, but it's misunderstood. Um, that's what the documentary is about. It's a great movie, if you haven't seen it. Okay. And I was playing with that idea, but it's sort of the opposite, that the South is often portrayed on screen as one thing. And even, even with insight, like a lot of movie, like a lot of movies set in the South are trying to say something about the South, and they think that they understand it. And for me, the South isn't just one thing. I mean, for anyone who's ever lived anywhere down there, it's not one thing, and so it's never really captured on screen properly because it's it's complex and myriad and contradictory. But it's supposed to be kind of funny and catchy. I mean, I, I you know, <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I'm making the book sound. Uh, academic or or uh, i mean it, you know it's supposed to be kind of fun to read yeah but no yeah. it is I, I i i mean what would you call it exactly i mean it's it's kind of almost like an extended essay it, yeah it's, well, it's it, like a it's like a uh, series of it's probably three or four books technically i mean it could have been but it's like uh variations on a theme uh, i guess uh but uh, it's also personal and it's I'm in it. I pop up here and there uh, in the book, but yeah. Yeah. So that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Right. And I'm an outsider now, honestly, and growing up in Pensacola, I'm an outsider. Right. So I can like see the South. I feel the South differently coming from like a druggy beachy little redneck outpost. It's different for me. 
and then leaving and not having, honestly, not having nostalgia, not really wanting to move back. I didn't, uh, I feel, I mean, I miss my friends and family and stuff, but I'm actually much happier in Chicago. So there's, there's like a lot, that was kind of the motivating perspective for me. And so I'm working through, honestly, I'm working through some of my own uh, ambiguity and ambivalence about the place where I grew up. And yeah. I'm using the movies to do it because that's, I love them and I understand them. They help me understand the world better than, than other stuff I might've used to write it, you know, to write about. Well, and it's tricky with Hollywood if you're writing a book about you know, a sense of regionalism, it, whether it be the South or the New York, New York or the West Coast or whatever. I mean, usually any movie that's set in L.A. is set in L.A. because that's where they make the movies. So, of course, they're going to show you, you know, whatever Hollywood Boulevard or something. But like, yeah, the South, you don't really know where the hell they filmed it. I mean, sometimes it's very specific, but it's Hollywood. So they mess with your head. So a lot of things that you think were filmed in the South weren't yeah. or vice versa. Some things you didn't think were filmed in the South were, um, yeah. and now Atlanta's kind of, a, a the Hollywood of the South. A lot of stuff is filmed there. And sometimes you can kind of tell in a movie, but when you're talking about this issue of, you know, like there's not one South, there's not even one South in certain States. I mean, Correct. like Florida, yes. the Northern part is the Southern part. Correct. The southern part is Miami and the Everglades and whatever the hell's going on there. Yes. So it's like, <laughs> well, Florida is so bizarre, right? So Florida and Texas, right. the best films are set in those two states, and it makes sense why they're the biggest and they're the most complex and they're the weirdest. Uh, and Florida, you know, most of the films of set in Florida, I find, were about um, corruption or environmental uh, disasters. Like they're in the background, but they're there. Um, and the corruption can be druggy, beachy, tourism, kind of hedonism stuff, or gangsters, you know, going for vacation or politicians uh, on the make. But yeah, this is like those, those, those topics come up again and again in Florida films. And I was shocked. I mean, I could have written a whole book about Florida uh, and it would have probably been a good one. I mean, it would have, because uh, I was shocked at all the films that were set there. Okay. So I know I'm not quite answering your question. One of the things that I found fascinating in this is I started looking behind the characters, like at the backgrounds of stuff going on, like what what's going on with the setting and the you know uh, the land, and it was really interesting because you would st you like start to see you get a sense of the space of where they're filming. But yeah, I think you're right. Like Florida, Texas, Georgia is like Atlanta, and then everything outside of Atlanta, right? Uh, the Carolinas are bizarre. And there's like four or five different little uh, nation states in there. And it's, you got Tennessee is Memphis and Nashville. The two cities have nothing in common, except they both like a lot of music. Well, and you sort of see these rivalries between certain cities in a state too. Like to use Nashville, there's sort of like Team Nashville, then there's Team Memphis. And they're two very different cities. I am on Team Memphis. Just I'm on Team, Tem Team Memphis too. Um, Musically. <laughs> I've only been to Nashville once, so I don't want to come down too hard on Nashville. But no, I, I hear just, it's great. I've only driven through it. I, mean, I find say, Memphis just more interesting. Generally, if I'm going to have like soul or and blues, yeah, or and maybe a little funk or country, I'm going to go with like the former. Well, and Memphis sort of has that. Well, this city's it's it's the best days are behind it. So there's yeah. kind of this. <laughs> tragic beauty of seeing it fall apart oh um, yeah whereas nashville you know it's like 100 people a day are moving in or whatever crazy number it is um so yeah i mean and and it's unfortunate too because in a place like virginia i mean there have been movies that have been shot here but i feel like it's a totally under utilized state in terms of movies here i mean the locations probably even civil war movies aren't ever shot here shot i was shocked whatever. at how at the dearth of movies that have anything to do with virginia yeah that aren't like revolutionary war era <laughs> and i just wasn't really i wasn't like going to that you know but yeah. there's not much and there's like remember the titans okay. uh, which is northern virginia there's some beltway stuff where people will like jut you know, they'll like shoot down to virginia to get away from dc but there wasn't 
there just wasn't much. And so Virginia is not really in the book much, even though it's, you know, clearly a huge part of the South, but I don't. Yeah. No, I, it's, you know, I, yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll film stuff here as a double for Washington, D.C. I mean, parts of Lincoln were shot here and some other movies that don't have anything to do with the Civil War. So every now and then, and it's probably they're, they're victims of their own uh, lack of creativity in terms of drawing people here to shoot, you know, give yeah. them tax breaks and stuff like that. But, sure. uh, also, yeah, no, there's I not a lot. Virginia is not, it's successful. Like part of the Southern mystique is you have to have failure and um, oppression, I believe, anyway. Yeah. And um, that failure and oppression can take the form of, can take many forms. And so for black Americans, it's slavery and segregation, Jim Crow segregation. But for like white, poor white Southerners, it's, um, you know, the failures of reconstruction. Um, so I like Virginia doesn't have, I mean, even though they had slavery, I think, um, yeah, I, you could also, and I'm sure people have, you could write essays, an essay about why Virginia isn't better represented on screen, but I think there's something in there. Well, and I think too, it, it wouldn't have to be a movie that was especially Southern either, but just sort of showed the landscape of a place like Richmond and was about, the punk scene in the early eighties or something, you know I mean? Just to kind of give a different yeah. twist on it because people aren't here obsessed about what the South means all the time, you know, I mean, yeah, of course not. <laughs> people living their lives and they're consumed with pop culture the way everyone else is. So it's like, it could just be a very universal story that, that was set here. Um, but I think there's always that temptation too in Hollywood is like, well, if we're going to f- film something in the South, that needs to be about the South. Yeah. No, in fact, I would say if you want it to be in Nowheresville, Nowheresville, you're going to pick Indiana or Ohio. Um, yeah. If you want it to be, but if you're going to set it in Texas, it's going to be about Texas. Like you're never right. going to see something in Texas where it's not like Texas isn't somehow the reason that the, the, the film exists. Uh, novels and stuff too. Uh, you know, and I, I find that really fascinating. Frankly, I, I don't, you know, I, I don't know why that is. Ohio has its own personality, I think. Uh, I don't know. But yeah, I, I was I was really blown away how it's like, now we're going to talk about racism because this film is set in Georgia, right? <laughs> Which is like, I'll just say, I lived in Atlanta and I live in, I now live in Chicago. Atlanta is light years ahead of Chicago in terms of, um, you know, people getting of different groups getting along and actually spending time together. Uh, yeah. And I, I, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. I, I didn't, I, I think the South is, uh, I say it in the book, right? It's a place and an idea. And both the place and the idea are contradictory and troubling and they have to atone. We have like stuff we have to atone for. But, the idea that like, and it's changed recently, but that all of America's racial sins are in the South and the rest of the country is like enlightened is just crazy. And that's what the movies were saying though, uh, for a long time. Look at Green Book, right? In Green Book, the cop, they get stopped by cops. I want to say it's in Tennessee or Alabama or Georgia. They get beaten up and arrested, right? It takes a phone call from the president to get him out. And then right when they cross the Mason Dixon Dixon line, they're in Southern Illinois, they get pulled over by a cop and the cop's like, Hey fellas, can I help you with your flat tire or whatever? (laughs) And that's just crazy. Right. And total death considering all the like shootings and so on that were going on in like huge chunks of the North. Yeah, no, I mean, and you do sort of carry your story over into other parts of the country. I mean, at one point you do talk about do the right thing, the Spike Lee movie. And it's not set in the South, obviously yeah. it's set in Brooklyn, but it's dealing with the same topics and, and showing, as you just said, like this is a national problem, racism. It's not just about the South. And I talk about that because it's in the context. I have a, the last chapter is about sort of black cinema in the South and the initial, the original draft, it was like 70 pages it was like a little mini history, just of black cinema. And the editor was like, hey, you've like totally lost track of the South. 
And I said, well, I'd like to keep Do the Right Thing in because it like, it's the standard by which these other films are, are going to be measured, right? And it was so, and I talk about Driving Miss Daisy and how that whole thing, and I think um, Do the Right Thing is, it, it's a great film. I mean, I love it. it yeah, it, I just yeah. watched it. It's great. It's got great energy. It's got great performances. It's wonderful. And it's, it's troubling in a way that a good film should be. A Definitely. Good, but, um, you know, Driving Miss Daisy is a good movie. Uh, it should not have beaten Do the Right Thing for Best Picture, but it's a good movie. It's well made. It's also kind of troubling in its way. It's it's funnier than people are going to be expecting. Um, but so I talk about Do the Right Thing in part because of that, because it was like such a big deal when Driving Miss Daisy won Best Picture uh, and Do the Right Thing did. And uh, Green Book also beat out Black Klansman, another Spike Lee movie. Uh, and he said something like, well, whenever someone gets driven anywhere, I lose. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I've never actually seen Driving Miss Daisy, but I I remember when it came out, and you I mean, you, you describe it very well. Um, yeah, obviously two very different movies, uh, Do the Right Thing and Driving Miss Daisy, and tonally, yeah, um, I guess Driving Miss Daisy is the more sort of traditionalist type of movie that Hollywood can can digest better than a, a Spike Lee type of movie. Um, yeah, but it's, you know, there are, she's Jewish and there's like yeah. another dimension to the film with that. And I think crit, people who kind of dismiss it without watching it are missing out on it's, it's come, it's sophisticated and it's directed with real skill. Uh, it's an Australian director, Beresford. Uh, I don't know if that's how you say his name, Bruce Beresford. And he, it's there's like not an inch of fat on that film. It's it's really it really cooks, you know. Uh, and so I think, yeah, I don't think it's misunderstood. That would be a dumb thing to say, but I think it's because it's attached to do the right thing. The, it's there's no reason for it to be attached to do the right thing. It's not <laughs> like the people who made it said, "Hey, we're going to have a counterpoint to do the right thing, and we're going to beat it for best picture." It right. just so happened that they came out at the same time. Uh, I, I think Morgan Freeman's performance is great. I do understand people's concern at the time and even now, but I just, I mean, it's fascinating. And someone should write a book about the two movies, right? The making of them and how they were received, but, uh, do the right, uh, do their thing is a better film, but you know, Drive Miss Daisy, it's quite good. Yeah. Well, that happens a lot with the Oscars. I mean, there are movies that win Best Picture, and then 20 years later, you, there's another that maybe wasn't even nominated that's obviously, you know, was the Best Picture for that year. And sure. Goes along with actors and, you know, their roles, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, I, 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 don't, I don't know why I haven't seen it. I guess it just, just didn't, you know. I, it I didn't seems take like it would be boring. I know why you didn't see yeah, it. Yeah, I was, it I was a teenager. Like yeah, but yeah. now, even now, like I, I didn't want to watch it. I was like, "That's going to be boring." <laughs> but like right away, I was like, "Oh, wait a minute, this is interesting." And Dan Aykroyd is really good in it, right? And yeah. the movie, it's interesting. The movie doesn't. So, a key scene in the movie: Martin Luther King comes to Atlanta to speak, and Miss Daisy wants to go see him because she's in her politics progressive, not in her personal life, but in her like in her beliefs, she's progressive. Her son wants, believes he's progressive too, but because he's a businessman, he doesn't want to go because he doesn't want to lose any business, right? And so here's the kicker. Miss Daisy goes and Morgan Freeman's character, Hoke, he has to stay in the car and he like listens to the speech later on the radio. He doesn't even get to go. And so the, it's not like the movie's like, it's... It's just the it's it's more complex, I think, than people expect. No, well, I don't remember. It was you know it was well reviewed when it came out and stuff. But yeah. I, I I guess it was just yeah. At the, at the time, I'd I'd rather watch Do the Right Thing, and that was a pretty you know angry kind of yeah. audacious movie, and just the camera work and stuff was was <laughs> unique and everything. It was just it was more of a movie for a teenager, I think, <laughs> who oh, liked one- movies at the time. Oh, it's a and, wonderful movie. And Siskel and Ebert were just praising it all the time, so I had to see it. Um, <laughs> right. Did you grow up watching those guys? 
Siskel and um, Ebert? Well, only a little bit. I remember an early one I saw was they reviewed Raiders of the Lost Ark before I had seen it. And then I was like, oh, man, I got to see this movie. Uh, and uh, I love Roger Ebert's great movies. In fact, if I could, um, they're some of the most important books in my life, uh, which is a really weird thing to say. I'm not like a huge fan of him as a critic, but his writing about movies that he loves, um, he's really, he's unparalleled. I mean, I read Pauline Kael for her like attitude and her prose, and I read David Thompson for his prose and his, you know, you intera interaction with the great mind. But Roger Ebert, it, those books are almost wise. And his TV show, I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I've seen 20 episodes or something. I don't know. No, I, I I still read him. I mean, I I read him a lot. I have a, a couple of his collections. I mean, I, I just read him over and over again. And 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 like you say, like I appreciated him as a critic, but it just as a writer, I think I, I that's why I loved it. Just his oh, voice and yeah. as you say, there was yeah, there's a certain amount of wisdom there. His, his so, memoir is really good too. Life itself. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's great and. I guess everybody kind of has their person. I mean, I'm, I'm not so much in the, in the, I, I don't love Pauline Kale, but, uh, I have oh, read her and I love her writing style. I mean, I yeah, love I mean, she's her. a great writer. She's a bad crit okay. She's a great writer, but a bad critic, right? Because she, um, didn't re, she never re visited as far as I could tell. She never, and I'm a fan, but she wouldn't, she was ever wrong. Right. Like ever. Yeah. And, <laughs> and she was very quick to make judgments that that I'm not sure she had earned. However, she's such a fun writer and she's so clever and and you know, she's in, she's a I, I mean I love her. I adore her. She would have hated me. I mean, she would have <laughs> she would have talked to me, right? She would have hated my book and she wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> However, I like, you know, she is really special for me. And David Thompson who uh is just a magnificent um I mean, he's idiosyncratic. Uh but he's magnificent. But I mean, I read uh, Hadley Freeman, who did a great book about the 80s cinema. Life Moves Pretty Fast, I think was the name of it. Uh, I mean, I read, I read a lot of movie books. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Roger Ebert's special. Well, I think he, to make you feel better, I think he probably would have liked your book. <laughs> well, it Pauline... does make me feel better, Colin. Because, <laughs> um, I don't know, just something about Pauline Kael's tone, I, I just can't really stomach it long term. But yeah, Sometimes she, to this. she yeah. said she described the European art films from the 60s. She was like, I'm going to sum them up in one phrase, soul sick and late to the party. And it was like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> I mean, she's right. Like all those films, there are almost all of them that gets it right. Like uh, and but it's also kind of a mean and you know, she's a reductionist, whatever. I, I'm yeah, a big fan. Yeah. But. Yeah. Well, I think maybe part of it, Ebert being from the Midwest, maybe kept him a little, a little more, uh, I mean, he could be in a, he could be an acerbic guy, but I, I think there's some kind of Midwestern quality to him or something that maybe kept him a little bit more grounded. Whereas Kale writing from New York, is just sort of, that New York thing where yeah. people are just mean for the sake of being mean sometimes. Well, well Ebert rewatched films all the time and yeah. he, would, he would revisit and he was wrong about like, he was wrong, but he would say like, yeah, I just got this one, you know, yeah, I got this one right wrong. But he had the benefit of writing about movies his whole career. Um, and the reason I like those great movies is he's you need to talk about films. He's watched dozens of times, like with audiences. And, he, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's like, it's good stuff. Yeah. Well, what are some for you, like movies about the South? Like what would be your favorites, your top five or a few that you'd say you definitely got to see this. So there's a Roger Corman cheapy called the intruder that really blew me away. And it stars, um, William Shatner of all people. <laughs> and he plays a guy who comes to a small town and starts ripping up like they're going to they're going to integrate and he starts causing trouble over integration just because to like gain power and he likes it and i was stunned by this film and i felt like this could have been filmed 
you know, in East St. Louis or um, this could have been filmed in the suburbs of Atlanta, outside of Atlanta, like the, 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 the storyline and the, I don't know, it really, it's a really haunting film. And this is something I never would have watched. Right. I mean, I, you know, it's a be like a super low budget drive-in kind of cheapy. And yeah, it's really good. Uh, another one was Nothing But a Man, which was a, a rare film set in the South from Black characters' point of view, but it's not, uh, it's set, filmed in the 60s. It's very realistic. It is a low budget, like an independently produced film, but wonderful. And it follows a guy who is um, a decent guy, right? And he meets a girl and he likes her and they start dating, but he can't, uh, the white world can't, he can't breathe. And you start seeing him turn angry and anyway, it's beautiful and wonderful, wonderful film. And I couldn't recommend it enough. Yeah. Um, a really good little foxes, is a Betty Davis film from the, like that came out in the early forties that blew me away. Uh, William Wyler directed it. And I, it's about a family, a mercantile type family. It's sort of a play, a Lillian Hellman play, but it's really well filmed. And moving and, and haunting and i just you know i had heard about the play a lot but that movie really sh struck me and then finally a couple of newer ones uh hell or high water is a bank robber movie set in texas yeah. that really just blew me away and and good god moonlight right i mean there's like all of cinema you know and and inside the story of a, a gay black ch child in miami which like i've never seen that story before yeah uh, and I, I think those, uh, and I'll, I'll t I end the book with Free State of Jones, um, which was a movie I didn't want to watch. I thought I knew what I was going to, I thought I knew what I was getting into. I thought I knew what I was getting into with that. Yeah. And I was wrong. And it was uh, rigorous and, 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 and compelling and so fucking grim. I mean, you know, so just anyone's going to watch it because it follows a, a real place that declares itself independent from the Civil War. It's not going to fight on either side. And they outlaw slavery and racism. But you see all these characters fall back under the empire once Reconstruction ends. So the last 30 minutes of the film is the undoing of all the, you know, headway that the black characters have made. And it's just, I'm, you know, unbelievable. Um, and that's one... I, you know, I don't know if I'd put it on a Friday night on a summer evening if you're like looking for a good time, but um, a really, really, really powerful. Yeah. And have you seen anything recently, like in the last few months, maybe that you would like to add? Um, I'm I trying to think. Seen, so I wanted to see I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Minari is on my list. It's the Korean family moving to oh, Arkansas. I think right, it's been yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that yet. Um, I will. And I, you know, but I'm not, I'm not writing a book about Southern movies anymore. So it's not like at the top of the list. However, yeah. um, I mean, no, not, not that's, that's a, that's one that like had cultural cachet and um, it's telling like an immigrant story in the South, which I'm really interested in. There's, Mine Hunter season two. Well, it's not that new; it's a couple years old, but it's set in Atlanta. Following the while I lived there, following the child killer uh, Wayne Williams. Oh yeah, and I yeah. was living there like when it's set. So that was I kind of that shows up near the book into the book a little bit. But for me, it was very strange, right? Because I'm writing, I'm finishing up this book about Southern movies, right? I'm born in Atlanta. I start watching the show that I love, and and, and they they end up in Atlanta. The, the year, like when I'm growing up, right, right down the road, I mean, it's a little bit of ways, but right down the road from where I was living. And it's this like just ghastly story that I, I obviously wasn't aware of when I was six. Yeah. But, uh, it was weird, you know, but it really stunning. I mean, you know, people talk about like the de your question earlier, the death of cinema. If every show were as interesting and strong as Mindhunter, I mean, movies, it's game over you know yeah uh, it, it's an interesting show and it, yeah there, it's those the stories it gets into are 
well, I mean, they're, they're dealing with the most depraved people possible. So yeah. it's it's a pretty disturbing shot. It's David Fincher, right? Didn't he yes. yeah. do that? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there you go. <laughs> and uh, Carl Franklin. They had two good directors in season two. Carl Franklin did some of the episodes, too. Okay. Um, and then the show Atlanta, right? I'll finish with my hometown. Was a, uh, It's jaw-droppingly amazing. I would argue it's a film, right? It's two... Each season, it's like a couple of different short films. That's how I see it, the show. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's like Twin Peaks and Louie and meets, um, I don't know, some like hip hop documentary. And I just couldn't stop watching. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Yeah. You know? I mean, I was like, I couldn't believe how good it was. Yeah, right. that, that was. I think they only did two so far, right? Of that yeah. show. I, yeah. I hope they're doing another one. I don't know. Yeah, what I'll say, and I, I know I'm rambling here, but I'll say, like, yeah. it's a, uh, it does capture an el- elements of Atlanta. There's a lazy, hazy weirdness, might not be the right word, but there's a kind of low key, even when bad stuff is happening, uh, feel. And that's like how it was when I lived there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just real quick, are you working on another book? I have three. I have two books at two different presses that are supposed to come out. One is called The Bad Class. It's about juvenile delinquency in early 1980s movies. But it's also about like a friendship of mine that uh, ended weirdly. I would say if this is like a jazzy, you know, riffy kind of book, that's like my punk uh, cousin to this book. Okay. I've written a biography of Joseph H. Lewis, who's an old filmmaker who um, it's got, I have a contract for it, but I have to do rewrites and they're, you know, I've got some work ahead of me. Yeah. And then I, I have just, I, I don't have a publisher for it yet, but I've written a book about a prominent um, evangelical figure and a serial killer. Uh, it's nonfiction. Um, and I'm, I have high hopes. Okay. Wow. Well, you, and you have a full time job, so getting this amount of writing done—that's uh, that's substantial. Yeah, so. I'm. I'm. It's stupid. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> I'm trying. I mean, I I drive myself. You know, I'm I'm always on the edge of a nervous breakdown, uh, and it's it's a weird pathology, right? But I I've stopped interrogating it. You know, uh, I don't worry about money uh, or success. I just try to keep doing it, or else uh, I'm angry and blocked up inside <laughs> yeah i hear that the, the the need to keep working um um well um ben it's been great talking to you man i'm glad you we could too, do this Colin. yeah thank you buddy and uh i'll be in touch i i don't think this will be up until january but uh I'll, I'll let you know when it's ready thanks buddy all right thanks a lot man take care all right. bye Colin. bye All right, that was my talk with Ben Beard. I hope you enjoyed that. Once again, his book is The South Never Plays Itself, the film buff's journey through the South on screen. You can also get my book, Marching Masters, Slavery, Race, and the Confederate Army During the Civil War, available through University of Virginia Press. haven't sold a book in a few weeks, so you could help me out a little bit by buying that if you're interested in the Civil War. And I've been trying to finish up the work on my index for the Johnny Cash book. That is a tedious process, but almost through that. And there's probably a more efficient way I could do it, but I'm doing it how I think I can do it. And i got to wait for the final proofs to come back before I can assign all the page numbers to my topics and subjects. So uh, that's been taking a while but i wanted to get ahead of that so i've been working on that in my spare time and trying to catch up on some reading i've been reading the the anthony bevor book on the battle of berlin maybe just to uh read about a time period where things were worse for humans uh it's a pretty uh horrendous story the, the i mean the russians amazingly come come across as the real villains <laughs> of this book i mean just in terms of how they're conducting the war uh and, and treating civilians even their own civilians or the own the, the russians treating uh russians and other people that were part of the soviet union uh, very badly basically anyone that was that was captured by the germans might be taken as a a traitor uh because they 
uh, didn't kill themselves or didn't become a partisan or were somehow collaborating with the Nazis, even if it was just the fact that they were in a, a prisoner of war camp or a slave laborer or whatever. So it's just, it's just really insane to read about. And I'd read Bevor's book on Stalingrad many years ago and enjoyed that and decided I felt like reading something about World War II this winter. Uh, not to cheer myself up, obviously, uh, but just to uh, understand that conflict a little better because it was, it was pretty horrendous right, right to the bitter end there. So that's what I've been reading. Always reading a lot of history, but we'll definitely want to read a little bit more fiction this year. I got a lot of stuff on my shelves. I don't I don't separate them by unread books because I feel like that would scare me too much if I, if I had to look at shelves of unread books. So I just kind of put them around the house and every now and then I'll pick something up that I haven't read before. All right. Well, I hope you're doing okay and hope that we all have a safe and healthy and much better 2022 than was the case in 2021, which as bad as 2020 was, 2021 somehow just kind of felt worse. Let's just plow ahead, okay, and, and, and try to enjoy ourselves when we can. I'll be talking with you soon. Take care. Bye.